Coming up, Storm Path. We'll take a look at the science behind those powerful storms called hurricanes. Also ahead, what's on your mind? How do astronauts float? Plus, healthy options for your school lunch. We've got some ideas for you. This is NBC Nightly News, Kids Edition. Welcome back to Nightly News Kids Edition. Hope you guys had a great first week of fall. We've got a jam-packed lineup ahead, including our picture of the week coming to us from the Middle East. We'll get to that in a few moments. But first, let's begin with one of the top stories making headlines lately, and that's the weather and hurricane season. Did you know that warmer water is helping the Atlantic hurricane season intensify? And here to tell us about the science behind these powerful storms is our good friend, Al Roker. Weather is something we experience every day. We check it to see what we wear, <laughs> if our ball game's going to be canceled, and when we can go outside to play with our friends. We have sunny days, rainy ones, and sometimes really stormy weather. One of the planet's strongest storms is a hurricane. But how does it form? A hurricane is a large and powerful storm with winds that can reach up to 200 miles per hour. From space, they look like a giant spinning pinwheel hundreds of miles across. Clouds rotating around the center where conditions are clear and calm. This is called the eye. Hurricanes form in water that's at least 80 degrees. In the Atlantic Ocean, most hurricanes form when the water is warmest between June and November. The water warms the air above it, causing it to rise. As the air rises, clouds and thunderstorms form. To replace the rising air, winds at the surface start to rush in. This air also rises and forms even more clouds, making the storm bigger and stronger. The winds get faster and faster, and when they reach 39 miles per hour, it's a tropical storm and gets a name. When the winds hit 74 miles per hour, it's officially a hurricane. As long as hurricanes stay out over the ocean, they're pretty harmless. But sometimes, winds can push the hurricanes toward land. They might curve to the north and miss us, but other times, they hit the coastline with heavy rain, flooding, and strong winds. So, how do forecasters know what's happening inside the storm? They fly right into it. Why? So they can gather information about the storm. What are the three things you can do to make sure you and your family are prepared? Know where to get weather information. Weather.gov. NOAA.NHC.gov and your local news. Know where you'll go, like with a relative or to a shelter. A list of important items to take with you, including a flashlight, a phone, a tablet charger, and favorite snacks. Talk to your folks, make a plan, and you'll be ready if a storm comes your way. Okay, Al, thanks so much. It's time now for What's On Your Mind. One of our viewers just sent this one in about space. Hi, my name is Henry, and I live in Illinois, and my question is, how do astronauts float? I like your hat, Henry. Well, here with the answer is former astronaut Mike Massimino. Lester, thanks for throwing that uh, question my way. And Henry from Illinois, thank you so much for asking that question. That is a great question. How do we, uh, how do we float in, in zero gravity? How do we do that? It's because gravity doesn't affect us while we're in orbit around the Earth. The astronauts on the space station don't have to worry about gravity affecting what they're doing because it, we're going so fast in orbit, you're going 17,500 miles an hour, that gravity does not affect you and everything floats. You float and all your stuff floats. And you realize this as soon as you get to space. Right after the engines quit and I was in space in my very first space launch, I realized I was in a different place. My arms just floated up like this, Henry. Our arms stay down like this because of gravity when we're on Earth. But in space, they'll just float up like this. I was still strapped in, but my arms floated up. And I could feel myself kind of get lighter. And I had a pen on the, on the end of a string, and it floated up right next to me. Just like this, I saw my pen floating. And then I took my helmet off, and I put it right in front of me, and I let go, and there was my helmet floating in front of me. And then it was time for me to get out and enjoy the fun. So I unstrapped from my seat and I started floating around and I realized I didn't know what I was doing because it's really hard to practice this because we have gravity all the time on earth. There's certain ways we can try to simulate it, but not really like we are in space. And as soon as I got out of my seat, 
I couldn't control myself and I grabbed something and I unfortunately grabbed an electrical switch and turned something off that was supposed to be kept on. And I had to tell the mission control center, I made this mistake because I was learning how to float in space. And they said, that's okay, just put it back where it was. And I did. And from then on, I was very, very careful. You can move very easily, but you have to be very careful because you can kind of overdo it. So very lightly do you float around the spaceship and it's a wonderful way to do things. You can have something in your hands and put it down and it'll just float right there, just right in front of you. You can use the whole room. Imagine if you would go float around your room. That's what we could do. We could float around our room. So we got very used to floating around. It's, a, it's kind of easy after you get used to it and you love it so much that you miss it when you get back to earth and now you've got to readjust I got back from my space flight, we landed, the doctors checked us out, and my commander and I got done a little early, so we went to have lunch in crew quarters at the space center, just, just were in space a couple hours earlier, and we're having our lunch, and my commander has a very big glass of water, and he takes a sip of his water, and I'm telling him a story, and he's listening like this very intensively, and he holds his glass right up in front of him like this, and this made sense, this used to work when we were in space just a couple hours ago, and he slowly lets go, expecting the glass to stay there. But of course it fell right to the table and got us both soaking wet. And that's how I knew I was back on earth. So I prefer being in zero gravity. It's an easy thing to do once you get used to it. And Henry, thank you again for that great question. Mike, thanks so much for that. And full disclosure, Henry is my five-year-old grandson from Illinois. He had that question. I couldn't necessarily answer it, so I'm glad we're able to answer it here on the program. Well, let's head overseas now to the Middle East for our picture of the week. A zoo in the Gaza Strip just welcomed three newborn lion cubs, bringing the total number of lions at this zoo to 11. Congrats on your new arrivals. All right, back at home, as millions of kids settle into the new school year, one thing that's always an important learning tool is making sure you eat a balanced diet, and that includes a good lunch. Here with some school lunch ideas is author and mom, Sarah Garoppolo. Sarah, thanks for being here. First of all, you've got some tips for parents and kids on school lunches that they can prepare at home. Let's start with a simple and healthy option. What do you have for us? Yeah, simple and healthy. So I'm hoping that parents can understand that they can make this in 10 minutes for their kids. And so the first one over here, we're having some ham and cheese roll-ups. And then over here, some organic carrots, berries, hummus. And you can literally buy this at the store, but find your healthy protein bar. Looks like pretty easy to put together, but for families who have a little more time to prepare, what options might you suggest? Yeah, the for parents who have a little bit more time, so I like to make pasta, and I made a simple pasta with red sauce, and I have ricotta on top. You can put any cheese you want, carrots, and then you slice up um, some fruit, nuts and seeds and what i'd love to do for my kids is to make my own raw protein balls over here with nuts and seeds and dates and uh, superfoods oh there's no no there's no chocolate in that that's chocolate oh that but is chocolate it's all it's all raw organic uh protein balls that you can make with your own vitamix um at, at home Oh, it looks terrific. And we know that kids and grown-ups alike love sweets. That's why I asked you about the chocolate. What would you suggest for lunch in terms of a healthier option? Healthier options? Um, I mean, I have another one over here that it's very healthy. This is literally, if you want to make rice, a little bit of protein over here. So hard-boiled eggs. You can cube up some healthy option of cheese, cucumbers, and over here, we have oat clusters with probiotics with apple and cinnamon flavor. And you can make that in like 20 minutes. Yeah, I love it. There's a variety of foods, and that's why they call it a balanced diet. Sarah, thank you very much for coming on with us today. It was really good to talk to you. Thank you, Lester. Well, a fun show today. That's going to do it for us parents. Just a reminder, if your child has a question about any topic in the news, email a video to us at nightlynewskids at nbcuni.com, and we'll try to answer them in an upcoming episode. You can also follow us on Instagram at nightlykids. Thanks for watching, everybody. Remember to take care of yourself and each other. So long.